Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and I'd like to thank the San Clemente City Council for, um, uh, for having me make this presentation to you. I have to apologize, my voice is a little squeaky today. Um, with the change of seasons here in Vermont, I appear to have picked up a virus, but I'll be okay. I'd like to talk to you today about the lessons that Fukushima should have taught us, but didn't. The first one of those is something called the design bases. Now what that means is, what do we expect Mother Nature can throw at us? Now for instance, a plant built in California is built for a, a, a stronger earthquake than a plant built in Vermont. A plant built in Florida is built for a stronger hurricane than a plant in upstate New York. So, that's called the design basis. What do we think Mother Nature can throw at us? Now, in law, that comes from 10 CFR, 10 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 50, Appendix A, which is something called the General Design Criteria. And General Design Criteria number two talks about design bases. But it's interesting, it's, it's deliberately vague, and um, there's no, um, no mathematical number to support the fact that um, you know, an earthquake must be this strong or a, a hurricane wind must be this strong. It's not in law. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission takes that general design criteria and, and basically says we believe it's a good thing to build a plant for the worst thing that Mother Nature can throw at us in about a thousand years. They go back over the historical record and they're supposed to find the worst thing that Mother Nature can, can do over the last thousand years of the geologic record. Now, I don't think that's happened. And the first lesson of, of Fukushima that we're not really learning is we need to look at, again, what we think is the worst Mother Nature can throw at us. For example, the tsunami at, at Fukushima was, uh, was well outside the design basis. But so was the earthquake at Fukushima. And some equipment in Unit 2, or Unit 1 rather, appears to have been damaged from the earthquake before the tsunami. And, and two other events in the last six months also bump right up against the design bases. One is the flood out in, um, out in the Midwest at Fort Calhoun. And the other is the earthquake on the East Coast at North Anna. Now all of these were right at or over what we thought the worst that Mother Nature could do to us in, the, in, in a thousand years. Now that four of these, two earthquakes, Japan and, and, and Virginia, a flood and, uh, and a tsunami, that all of them occurred in six months tells me that we really haven't anticipated what Mother Nature can really do. Now, let's do, some, let's do the math here. The math is that you know, once in a thousand years sounds like a long time. But really, if a nuclear plant runs for 60 years, put 60 in the numerator, and then in the denominator, put a thousand, and you wind up with a 6% chance that any nuclear plant over its lifetime will see an event as bad or worse than the design bases. 6% for San Onofre. 6% for Diablo Canyon, 6% for plants here in Vermont. Well, on top of that, there's about 60 nuclear sites. So if you take that 6% and multiply by 60 sites, you get about 360%. In other words, it's a near certainty that some plant in the United States over its lifetime will experience an event worse than designers anticipated. Matter of fact, more like three or four plants in the United States over their 60-year life will experience an event worse than the designers anticipated. Now, it's interesting though that what the designers anticipate and what independent science anticipate are two different things. And it really boils down to cost. The stronger you make a plant, the more costly it becomes. So a plant in California costs more than a plant in the East Coast because earthquakes are stronger in California. But a plant in Florida 
anticipates that it will get hit by a, a stronger hurricane than the, than the winds you might anticipate in um, upstate New York. Now, outside independent experts actually have anticipated that we really haven't designed for the worst, ca worst case. There were experts in Japan who said that the geologic record indicated three tsunamis as bad or worse than the one that hit them over a 2,000 year period. So experts in Japan outside of the utility that owned the plant were predicting that a tsunami could hit that wasn't just a 45 foot tsunami but could even be higher based on the record. Those experts were ignored. So as much as the design bases um, probably has been, been missed at least four times by industry experts, I think if you talk to independent experts, they'll tell you that it's highly likely that a much worse event than what we've anticipated could occur. You know, for instance, at San Onofre, San Onofre is designed for a one-foot tsunami. Now, on top of that, San Onofre has added a margin so they can withstand about a six-foot tsunami. But on the other side of the ocean, they had a 45-foot tsunami. I think there's experts who would say that a six-foot tsunami is probably not adequate for San Onofre. Well, there's two things we can do to avoid this problem, neither of which is being done. We can set a higher threshold. Rather than once in a thousand years, we can say once in 10,000 year event. Or we can listen to independent experts as opposed to industry experts when we're designing the plant. But whatever we do on design bases, I think it's important to remember that it boils down to money. The stronger the plant is to, design, to, to withstand what Mother Nature throws at us, the more likely it is to become cost prohibitive. The second thing I think we need to learn and haven't is, has to do with emergency planning. And within that, there's two parts. If there's an accident, who pays? And if there's an accident, who's in charge? Well, Tokyo Electric is worth about $100 billion. The event in Japan is going to cost about $250 billion. So Tokyo Electric is probably going to be driven into bankruptcy in the, as, as they pay for this. They're going to have to sell their assets. And the rest is going to be borne by the Japanese people. Now, in the United States, it's different. We have something called Price Anderson, and that limits the liability to the company that, uh, that has the accident to about $10 billion. And the remainder, $240 billion, would be borne by taxpayers. It would be the biggest industrial accident that's ever occurred in the United States. Now, within the United States, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has allowed something to happen uh, which actually minimizes costs, makes it impossible to go back at most of the utilities that own power plants. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has allowed them to become limited liability corporations. Now, what that means is, uh, let's take Illinois, for example. Uh, Exelon has uh, 17 power plants, most in Illinois. And each individual power plant is a limited liability corporation. So if a power plant has, a, has an accident, it has no more assets. And the other power plants are not the cause of the accident. Therefore, they don't have to carry the bill. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has allowed this to happen by changing the licenses of power plants. They used to be owned by utility companies and there were assets behind them. Now each nuclear plant is a limited liability corporation. Who pays is a really good question. The second question then is who's in charge? In Japan, I think you've noticed the, the uh, confusion about who's in charge. And I'd submit to you that the Japanese are the best prepared in the event of an emergency. They really took emergency planning seriously for years because they had earthquakes frequently. And even now, clearly, no one really knows who's in charge of cleaning up northern Japan and who's in charge of cleaning up the site. It's interesting, I've noticed as I've studied accidents over time that when an accident happens, 
the plant management recognizes really quickly that things are really bad. At Three Mile Island, the plant manager at 7.30 in the morning wanted to declare uh, an emergency and evacuate. Now he called the people at the home office about 150 miles away and they talked him down from that. At, at Chernobyl, the same thing happened. The plant management understood that, that things were really bad, but yet the bureaucracy didn't really recognize it and didn't spread the word. And, and of course at Fukushima we have exactly the same problem. The plant management wanted to inject salt water. They needed to inject salt water. And yet higher ups in the chain of command in Tokyo told, told the plant manager not to. He's a hero. He did what had to be done despite the fact that, that the government told him not to. So you get this situation where the people on the ground know how bad things are, but yet further up the chain of command, people don't make the right decisions. In Japan, the Fukushima prefecture, like a state, had potassium iodine pills available. What they do is they block the radiation that goes to your thyroid. They were stocked and they were ready to be used, but the state was prohibited from using them by the national government in Tokyo. It wasn't for seven days until the national government realized that they should release these potassium iodide pills. Again, the people on the ground really recognize the severity of the problem, but when larger organizations get involved, the time to respond lengthens and puts lives at risk. Now, in the United States, the situation is probably even worse. The Japanese understood how to do emergency planning and they still didn't do it right. Here we probably have five different entities that would be perhaps in charge. First would be the utility. Second would be the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Environmental Protection Agency, FEMA. And, and then also it's possible that the state could also say it's our job. So we have five different organizations. FEMA can't do it. FEMA is prohibited by, by law um, to, to be involved for more than 30 days, something called the Stafford Act. And so they're out of the picture. After Three Mile Island, the utility was in charge briefly and then the Nuclear Regulatory Commission came in and reported directly to the President of the United States. Now that's not part of any law or any plan. And I'd submit to you that allowing the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to be in charge is not the best thing to do if you're concerned about the health and welfare of the people surrounding San Clemente and the San Onofre plant. The reason is that right now there's a battle between the EPA and the NRC over the exposure to people after an accident. The NRC wants a hundred times higher exposures to the population after an accident than does the EPA. To get an idea about what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission really plans to do after a severe accident, it's a good idea to look at a computer code they use called the MAX2 computer program. M-A-C-C-S-2. It's used to determine the costs and benefits to society and whether or not a utility has to um, implement changes to their design in order to minimize the cost to you and I. It was designed not for a nuclear power plant accident but for a dirty bomb and the designer has actually renounced the program for the use the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is using. What are some of the assumptions they have in the code? They only look at some forms of cancer, not all, and they also don't look at other health effects caused by radiation. For instance, cesium attacks children's hearts and doesn't cause cancer, but it causes heart attacks and heart ailments. The code does not evaluate that. They assume that the radiation that lands on a field will be plowed under. There's no attempt by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to clean the fields after a nuclear accident. They hose down the houses and let that water run into the rivers. And interestingly, if it lands on a forest, they don't plan to touch the forest. The contamination will stay there until it decays in 300 years. 